Good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone tuning in from all over the world. For those watching the recording on YouTube later, we are so glad to have you as well to support and hype up Empowering Med's fourth event, an interview and Q&A session with Kristen Euknes, a non-traditional medical student who is highly accomplished in various research areas with a focus in radiation oncology. I am your host, Sophia, and before we start, I'll be briefly introducing our guest and a little about her background. As an older, non-traditional student, Kristen's path into medicine has been a long one. With a career in law enforcement settings and the completion of her pre-medical studies, in part from a hospital bed recovering from stage 3 endocervical cancer. Her road to medicine has traversed the role of caregiver, patient, and now the path to becoming a provider and the resilient student brings a wealth of real-world experience to the medical table. In addition to her pre-medical coursework, Kristen holds two master's degrees, one in accountancy with a minor in mathematics and management science, and another in criminal science with an emphasis in fitness testing and law enforcement. She is currently finishing her third master's degree in population health sciences at the University of Alabama, where she was an award-winning graduate research fellow. Additionally, she has consistently held a 4.0 GPA throughout her pre-medical coursework and throughout all her graduate programs most of which were accomplished while working 50 plus hours per week. Kristen completed a plethora of clinical shadowing and radiation oncology with one of the best delivery teams in the state of Georgia, as well as an orthopedic surgery at Andrews Sports Medicine. She is a cancer survivorship author and is currently conducting radiation oncology research for publication, specifically in the areas of cyber knife protocol effic efficiency and external beam radiation treatment interruption. She looks forward to completing her PhD, medical school, and pursuing a career in radiation oncology. We are super honored to have her here with us today to share her journey, advice, and several tips on navigating medical school, being a non-traditional student, and the obstacles she's had to overcome in life. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you, Sophia. It's uh, absolutely a pleasure to be here, and uh, I just want to send a shout out to those who uh, might be tuning in, um, who are in the path of Hurricane Ida. You are in my thoughts and prayers tonight. So uh, with that being said, uh, again, it's great to be here, and uh, I am open for questions. It's great to have you here. Anyway, without further ado, let's drive straight into today's interview. There will be a Q&A session afterwards for the audience to ask any questions they might have. But for now, my first question to you is, what drew you to criminal justice and law enforcement before medicine? Right. So it's not something that that came about all of a sudden. Um, this has always been. I mean, I've had a passion for medicine, and it was my goal to eventually go to medical school ever since I was a, was a, a young girl. Um, you know, uh, I really don't see a lot of philosophical differences uh, between a career in law enforcement and a career in medicine. Um, both require you to be expert in gathering facts, um, rely on a, on a basis of knowledge, and then act upon all of that uh, to achieve the desired outcome. Um, you know, uh, with a combination uh, of, of really trust, um, you know, in law enforcement, the public trust is critical. Um, trust in your fellow law enforcement officers is critical. Uh, and the same thing applies, but from the reverse concept in medicine. Um, you, you, to be successful, you really do have to have uh, the public trust and, and you have to be um, a doctor who is trustworthy, uh, not only as a peer, but, but as a caregiver and care provider as well. So um, the two fields are, are not as, uh, not as mutually exclusive as one would initially think. Um, but in terms of uh, drawing me forward into medicine, um, it really is the, the same thing that drew me from law enforcement um, and to law enforcement. And that is the ability to, to really use your skills and your knowledge and your abilities to problem solve. Thank you. In your introduction, you mentioned your recovery from stage three endocervical cancer. Could you walk us through the process of your diagnosis and how you initially dealt with that? Yeah, so I, I, I just want to say that the whole process in and of itself and the diagnosis, um, extraordinarily devastating. At the time, I was a, 
uh, a 34 year old um, athlete who lifted for Team USA. I was looking forward to traveling internationally. Um, I, I was at the top of my game all the way around. And, and if you'd have looked at pictures of me uh, while I had this raging stage uh, three, stage two B, stage three mass, um, you, you never would have thought that there was anything wrong uh, whatsoever, just from the outside, uh, from a third party perspective. Um, but in terms of my diagnosis, uh, the, the, the really the, the critical reality is I was misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed um, by what some would say and what the marketing says um, is the best hospital in the United States. Um, so that taught me a few valuable lessons, not only for me personally, but, but lessons that I can kind of carry forward. Uh, I knew something was wrong from the very beginning. Uh, my mindset had changed. Uh, I was oddly unable to focus on my tasks at hand. Uh, I developed sort of profuse um, abdominal and pelvic pain. Um, I got on a plane to uh, get some prolotherapy done for uh, a separate thing um, in Atlanta and landed in Austin, Texas with bilateral deep vein thrombosis. Uh, I knew it. I knew it when I landed. I knew exactly what it was. Um, it's, a, it's a pain quality that is uh, second to none. You really you, you experience it and you, you pretty much know exactly what it is. I uh, went to one hospital, a private hospital, was misdiagnosed. Uh, went to a second hospital at that point, fighting for my life. Uh, I knew I knew what this was, and I knew the next stop was a pulmonary embolism, and I didn't want to go down that path. Um, was finally diagnosed there with bilateral deep vein thrombosis. Was transferred uh, back to my home hospital, again one of the best hospitals in the nation, if not the world, um, and was utterly dismissed uh, by a vascular specialist who um, told me that there were sick people in the lobby and to go about my life. I was a 34 year old healthy athlete. Uh, I asked him to run uh, D-dimers. Uh, the D-dimers of course came back um, abnormal uh, and he kind of explained that away by by saying that it wasn't going to help my, my fears uh, to have a high D-dimer. Um, so with that being said, I, I knew something was very wrong. I knew I was likely um, in a situation where I was in a hyper coagulation state due to a malignancy. My parents had had cancer. It was in the forefront of my mind. I knew I was feeling that way for a reason. Um, I tried to go to the emergency room uh, and I indicated I had uh, profuse pelvic and abdominal pain. Uh, they said, you understand that means you have to go through a CT scan. And I said, well, of course, that's exactly what it means. Um, they missed it again. Uh, so at that point, I, I went to um, my gastroenterologist and had him do um, an EGD colonoscopy. And on the colonoscopy, you could see the mass pushing through um, in, into or against uh, my colon tissue. Uh, so from that point, it was a battle for my life. Um, was finally able to, to get into a GYN oncologist. Uh, we were in surgery early the following week. It was uh, a very messy, very aggressive tumor. He thought it was stage four when he opened me up, um, but through nothing short of an act of God, the the uh, nodes that he sampled continued to come back negative and inflammatory. Um, and at that point, once I recovered from that surgery, uh, I underwent um, radiation therapy uh, as well as HDR ring and tandem radiation. Um, all told, uh, after the the pelvic acceleration, uh, following that radiation and chemotherapy. Um, I spent about 31 hours in the operating room total, uh, radiation, chemotherapy, like I said, uh, also was in kidney failure for a time, had percutaneous nephrostomies, uh, as well as kidney stents, indwelling stents, um, also had a, uh, diverting ileostomy, um, so went through the whole ostomy route as well, uh, and then because of a lot of adhesive scar tissue, uh, I ended up with um, two separate small, full small bowel obstructions that required surgery and uh, an intensive management. So, um, you know, all told, it was a process of a couple of years. Um, people always ask me, well, hey, you, you lost a couple of years of your life. I, I don't look at it that way because that's a, that's a very, it's a very victim uh, way to look at things. And I don't look at myself as a victim. 
um, I look at everything that I had been through, it was two years of learning. Uh, and it was two years that springboarded me, for lack of a better phrase, uh, to my future. So, I mean, that is, that is essentially how um, my diagnosis came about. Um, and how I initially dealt with that was to continue to fight uh, and advocate for myself as a patient. Um, because in, in my mind's eye and, and my body was telling me exactly what was going on, uh, I chose to listen. Um, case in point, had I listened to the initial doctors, the initial doctors, uh, I wouldn't be here right now doing this interview. Um, that's for certain. So, you know, uh, like I said, it's all about lessons learned and, and moving forward from there. So, um, yeah, that's the, that's the totality of my, uh, of my journey, um, from diagnosis and my, uh, my initial dealings with that. That was definitely a difficult process to go through. How did you cope with the emotional and mental strain following your, your diagnosis? Right. So, I mean, it definitely is a latitude change. I will say that, um, what you previously believe to be normal is no longer the normal and it never will be the normal again. So, um, coming to terms with that and learning to cope from there. Um, thankfully, I, I had a very good friend who was a traumatologist. He did a lot of work with me uh, through the process to be able to kind of cope as I went along. Because again, these are, these are really not coping mechanisms most people come to the table with. They're, they're learned coping mechanisms. Um, I, had, I had buried both of my parents to cancer. Uh, I, I no longer had immediate family. It, it was me. It was me alone. So I relied on people who in some cases weren't reliable. Um, and in other cases, you know, they're, they're going through their own um, caregiver issues, right? The caregiver fatigue and, and compassion fatigue. So, um, you know, all of that, all of that has an effect um, on you as a person and, and how you move forward from there. So, you know, I, I think I had a lot of time <laughs> sitting in a hospital bed, sitting on, on my couch recovering, um, you know, trying to get past the, the, the side effects and, and so on and so forth and the treatment itself. Um, there, there is a, a modicum of truth to the saying that sometimes the treatment is as bad as the disease. Um, but it allowed me to, to really focus uh, and eliminate the static. You know, the static being everything outside of, of, you know, your immediate uh, future. And it allowed me to set some intentions. It allowed me to, to take those first steps to follow my dreams. I, I was never a person who kind of sat back and let things happen to me. I always tried to take an active role in that. Um, and I think my therapeutic team, who I call my therapeutic alliance, would, would tell you that. Uh, I was very quick to dispatch members of a therapeutic alliance who didn't want to be part of that therapeutic alliance uh, or who devalued me as a patient um, and, and my thoughts and my game plan. So, you know, I, I really used all of that time and all of that opportunity to set my intentions. Um, you know, I never, I never feared the process. Uh, it, it was always most about focusing on what I had faced and in hindsight, those battles that I was able to win um, graciously and gratefully and focusing on fears that I had to overcome, especially in the situation with, uh, with cancer. So that's kind of how it changed my latitude. Um, another way that, that is, is often forgotten is the financial impact. Um, I went from, from being okay, financially okay, um, to, to absolutely debilitated. Uh, in the matter of a couple of years due to what insurance didn't cover. Um, and that still haunts me to this day. I, it, it's, it's been um, eight and a half years and I'm still digging out. Um, so there is also some truth to the statement that, you know, cancer patients um, either have a, a, a long road health wise ahead of them uh, or they have a long road financially ahead of them. And that, that's absolutely true. So, you know, the financial impact is, is certainly one that can't be, can't be um, understated, so to speak. Has the treatment you have to undergo affect your pre-medical studies? Could you elaborate on some of the biggest challenges that you have had to go through? 
Yeah, so I, I think initially it, it had more of an effect than it than it does now. Now um, age is a factor uh, to some, not to me personally, but to some I encounter it is. Um, but, you know, I, I think um, initially I was doing, I was taking coursework from a hospital bed. I was taking coursework from an infusion chair. So, you know, um, finding the right fit at a, at a university institution where they were willing to work with me um, and saw saw value and saw promise and potential in me. Um, initially, was a little bit difficult, uh, but you know, I, I think things have a way of working out if you continue to put effort toward them. So, um, initially, that was that was my biggest issue. Um, really trying to to navigate, um, you know, my coursework if I was ill. Uh, you know, suffering from side effects like nausea and everything else. And anyone that's had the flu or food poisoning or in my situation, radiation and, and chemotherapy can tell you it's very difficult to work through nausea, uh, especially nausea that doesn't seem to have a cure. Um, so, you know, those types of side effects uh, take their toll. And, and obviously fatigue is, a, is another aspect. Um, chemo brain is a, a very, very real thing. And it's, uh, it's kind of like a sense of fogginess as you go about your day and you try to focus. Um, so those were all things that, that I had to kind of fight through and battle through, at least to get initial, the initial uh, pre-med courses taken care of. Who would you consider as your strongest support system throughout your journey? Yeah, so, you know, I would, th this is going to sound kind of strange, but I would consider my therapeutic alliance. Um, and what I mean by therapeutic alliance, for those that aren't familiar with that term, it's your medical team. It's those doctors and, and support personnel that you choose as a patient to surround yourself with um, in terms of your diagnosis and, and treatment that occurs thereafter. So um, I, I was difficult on my physicians. I, I, that's straight up honest. Um, I, I didn't go with the, the initial or obvious choices. I was very picky. I wanted someone who was going to work with me and see me as a person and not just a case or a case number. Uh, I found that. And, and those people, those doctors uh, and those support staff became an extended family for me. Uh, I know that kind of sounds odd uh, and it's sort of a unique situation. But um, now in a, in a couple of those cases, those individuals are my mentors. So, um, you know, you could call it kind of coming full circle, but I would say my biggest cheerleaders were my therapeutic alliance. Uh, also, you know, myself, I, I don't think you can count self out of the picture as a cancer survivor. Um, it takes a lot of grit, a lot of determination, and, and to some extent, a little bit of luck uh, to make it through this disease. And, um, you know, you no matter what you do, we all go through hardships in life, and and I, I think we have to credit ourselves for getting getting us through what we do in life. And uh, I, I think it would be it would be probably a bad thing to not give ourselves a little bit of credit every now and again. Um, you know, and also I have to say my network of friends uh, was pretty strong. Again, I didn't have family surrounding me when I went through this, so I built my own family. I built my own network. Um, and those people, you know, who were, were there to get me to treatment when I couldn't get myself there, um, who I was able to bounce ideas off of, and, and my traumatologist who was able to, to give me those coping skills, to give me a Rolodex of coping mechanisms, so to speak, that allowed me to make it through. Uh, and still, you know, with a changed latitude and a new sense of normal, uh, come out on the other side with, with uh, pursuable goals, aspirations, and dreams. No, it definitely doesn't sound strange. Going through your diagnosis and treatments, what are some things you feel like your doctors and care providers should have given more attention to that they failed to do when it came to interacting with you? Uh, that, that is a phenomenal question. Um, first of all, thank you for asking that question. Um, it, it, you know, there, there's a balance, right? There, there's, there's a balance between, you know, the physicians can only become invested uh, so much. Um, because there is compassion fatigue, there is caregiver fatigue uh, on, on their side, and, and that has to be mentioned up front. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, uh, going through cancer, um, when you have 
a sense that a physician is dismissing you, that should be a red flag. So I think the first answer to that question is time. Um, and time is a premium. Time is a premium for physicians. Uh, time is a premium for patients. And But that, that mutual give and take of time uh, and communication and understanding um, comes with that face-to-face -face contact and, and the giving of oneself as a physician to that experience and being part of that therapeutic alliance. Um, you know, I, it's not an us versus them. The, the disease can only be approached uh, from an us, meaning your therapeutic alliance, versus it, meaning the disease, and in the process try and treat the, treat the entire human. Um, I think it's important to spend that time. I think it's important to listen to the patient. Um, initially, in my diagnosis process, I was readily dismissed. Had I listened, I would be dead, and that is the that is a hard way to put the truth. Uh, but had that physician listened, I may have been diagnosed six months earlier. And maybe they would have caught it at um, a late stage one or an early stage two, as opposed to where it was caught and the carnage that it laid in the process. So listening skills, critical. Um, and I, I would say learn from the patient's experience. You know, don't, don't be um, so sure that you've seen this before and this is rote. This is a continuation of, of the previous patients and will be part of the future patients. Each individual case, you can rely on your experience and your knowledge, but each individual case, each individual person has to stand on their own um, when, you, when you greet their case and you meet them as individuals. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think that's critical. And I, I also think it's critical that if you don't feel that you're meshing well with a patient and you're giving them 100% and that they're giving you 100%, you know, perhaps it's best to steer them in a different direction. Maybe they would uh, have a, a better alliance, uh, a, better, a better team component with a different physician. So I, I would, you know, keep all those things certainly um, on the table as a physician. And, you know, again, learn learn from each patient's experience and what they have to offer. Because uh, I, I really see each patient as having a little bit of a pearl of wisdom um, that they can share with a physician to make them a better physician and a more well-rounded physician. Oh, sorry, I was muted. The points you brought up were definitely valid and so true. All right, so let's now dive into some aspects of medical school. What is the thing about medicine that excites you? Wow, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, there's, there's so much. Um, but I, I think it comes down to what I talked about earlier. You know, this is problem solving on its highest level. Um, in, you know, in terms of radiation oncology, you know, it, it's really at the forefront of cancer care. Um, it's a specialization in and of itself in oncology and it, you know, it uses radiation as, uh, it's, it's chief, you know, therapeutic modality. So being on the forefront of medicine, uh, and modality, as well as, you know, using problem solving skills in a whole new, new way and new approach, um, to benefit people and, you know, to problem solve on the highest level is something that, that just really is exciting. In your opinion, what are the most rewarding aspects of being a doctor? You know, I have to say it's the trust. Um, it's the trust placed in you, right? As a, as a physician, you know, you have human beings that, that trust you to help them navigate what are likely the darkest or could be the darkest moments of their life. You know, that, that's a special trust. That's a special bond. And, um, you know, that, that to me is the most painful, um, but utterly rewarding uh, aspect of the job.
Yeah, I think you're muted. So are there reasons I decided to become a doctor instead of other careers related to the medical field, such as nursing, PA, or dental? Can you repeat the question? You, you broke up. It sounded very, uh, very staticky. Are there, are, are those reasons why you decided to become a doctor instead of other careers related to the medical field, such as nursing, PA, or dental? Right. So, you know, all of those were on the table, um, right? And, and they remain on the table. But, you know, there's only one real path to radiation oncologists, and that's, and that's MD. Um, I also have a bend toward the operating room. And, you know, as, as a radiation oncologist, uh, as opposed to the other fields that you mentioned, you know, you could do, you could, you have the best of both worlds to a degree, right? You could do procedures, you could do um, radioactive implantations, high dose ring in tandem, um, you know, brachytherapy, applicator placements and things like that. You know, um, in addition to that, you know, you get, you get to really be on the forefront, like I said, of some less common problems and less encountered things in the field, um, as well as, you know, that I, I think it bears mentioning the greater level of autonomy. Um, and someone who is a non-traditional uh, learner, uh, a, a non-traditional elder person um, in the in the field in terms of being a student and then later becoming a doctor, uh, that level of autonomy is certainly important and did factor highly in my decision making. How do you think being a patient has transformed your perspective of medicine as compared to your peers? Yeah, another another great question. Um, I'd always wanted to be a physician. It was always going to be my goal to to retire from my career field. I can retire. I'm lucky enough to be able to retire rather young, um, based on the age range and age limits in law enforcement. And you know, so I, I had always uh, planned on going to medical school. But I I will say, as a patient, as a caregiver, I had my observations of caring for my parents who had who had cancer, uh, and passed from from their malignancies. Uh, but as a patient you have that whole new perspective um, that medicine itself, no matter what field you choose to pursue within medicine or what specialty you choose to pursue, um, really does need more people that can speak from personal experience. And uh, as I was laying in my hospital bed and, and going through my own treatments and my own trials and tribulations, um, you know, why not me? That, that was the question that continued to present. It's, it's why not now? Um, I can be that, that person, right? I, I've, I've been through that. I've been lucky enough to be on the other side. Um, granted, you know, it's always something I, I go through surveillance for. It's always in the back of my mind. Um, but, you know, as a physician, I can be able to go back into that proverbial forest um, that forest on fire, as it seems, uh, when you're going through the disease process and, and the treatment process. Um, and I could be able to go back into that forest on fire. And if I could lead people out, then, then may, maybe, that's, maybe that's my greater calling, right? Is to be able to identify with patients um, and, and be able to, to take them down uh, a path that I have followed. Uh, to treatment and and hopefully hopefully in in many cases wellness again, um, you know. So I I think that that is uh, that is something that I've I've taken with obviously learning as well uh, and and listening to patients. Um, those are skills that I've learned as a patient. Um, you know what's important. You know when a patient wants to be heard. And you know doing my clinicals. Um, in, in being able to talk to cancer patients and in some cases convince them that a certain treatment might be, you know, uh, give advice just in terms of the patient perspective, not the medical perspective, but from the patient perspective, you know, you, you will see eyes soften and they will look at you and say, you're one of me. 
you uh, you get it you understand and I really don't think there's a greater gift that I can give than myself back to medicine um, to try and, like I said, lead lead other patients and lead other people out of that forest, which at the time really feels like it's a forest on fire. So what has been the hardest part of being a medical student? Well, for me as a non-traditional, um, you know, pre-med into graduate school and then approaching med school, um, it's it's been the it's been balance right it's it's been balance so you know i work a 50 plus hour work week um i'm devoted to that job i i work more than 50 hours a week um and it's having a second day it's being able to turn off your work day and turn on your student day um you know some would say that that takes somewhat of a, a modicum of auto, being on autopilot and, and that might be true um, the other difficult thing I found is find a good planner, right? Find a good student planner, find a good life planner. Uh, I'm always on, on the lookout for uh, better tools to allow me to compartmentalize my day so that I could make the most uh, out of my day and that I'm not wasting time. Um, you know, I, 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 think that's, I think that's critical, you know, and it just really kind of comes back to balance and finding that balance and being able to plan that balance in your life, especially as a non-traditional student when you have uh, a, a more than full-time job and, uh, you know, in some cases, full-time student work and, and other things like clinicals and fellowships and, and everything else that, you know, I might be blessed enough to get and for those to come along. So, you know, balance is critical. What do you enjoy doing during your free time? <laughs> what free time? <laughs> no. Um, so, you know, I, I love athletics, right? Bowling, softball. Uh, like I had mentioned earlier, I was a competitive power lifter prior to being diagnosed. I still love being in the gym. Um, I have a Peloton, which has been great during the pandemic because it, it sits in my, in my room and I'm able to get on it sometimes a few times a day um, and, and, you know, take those classes. And, you know, uh, I, I used to hybridize uh, lilies and iris, and um, that's something that I really found solace in when I was going through treatment. Um, and it's something that I continue to do to this day, you know, uh, hybridizing uh, lilies and iris. So uh, those are the things I like to do in my spare time. Do you still do powerlifting now? You know, um, not competitively. Uh, I'd like to maybe get back in just from a bench press standpoint, but, you know, wearing the gear, the high compression suits and the, the heavy Valsalva maneuvers and things like that um, don't really play too well with the level of, of pelvic adhesions that I have uh, and, and the fact that I've been caught on numerous times, basically from sternum to, to pubic bone. So, um, like I said, new normal, but, uh, I, I still love the gym and it's one of my favorite places to be. Those are definitely really unique and interesting interests. Going back to your introduction, you mentioned that you were pursuing research. Could you tell us more about the research regarding perhaps radiation oncology or cyber knife that you're working on? Yeah, you know, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to, to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, like I said, I've been blessed with a research fellowship through the University of Alabama. Uh, I'm I'm the first distance student, so to speak, uh, to to get that. And again, I not a day goes by that I'm not grateful for the opportunities that I have. Um, you know, and it's about really taking advantage of those opportunities too. So you know, when they come along, you got to grab them. Um, and you know, part of the research that that I'm engaged in uh, with my mentor is is not just about uh, cyber knife and protocol because in, in a lot of instances the technology in radiation oncology and interventional radiology as well is is outpacing the protocol um, that that's chasing it right so you know learning from um, patients that are going through the treatment and designing protocol uh, and in doing it in a scientific way uh, is is critical to the field so I, I'm I'm blessed to be able to uh, engage in that kind of research um, one of the things uh, other than that that I am doing is focusing on radiation treatment interruption or RTIs um, and, and really taking a look uh, at RTIs from the, uh, the more rural uh, or underserved population standpoint and really trying to, to figure out why radiation treatment interruption uh, takes place 
the values behind it and what can be done to bring more patients in for their for their treatments and uh, you know obviously extend life uh, and extend and provide good quality uh, outcomes as well um, you know I could I could talk about this kind of stuff all day as far as uh, as radiation oncology and my RTI uh, research but you know for those that that don't know what it is and would like kind of a little bit of framework you know you, you if you talk about radiation uh, treatments you might hear the term fractionation and you know fractionation is the breaking up of a total dose into smaller doses uh, and you know those can be treatments delivered on uh, a multitude of different schedules and you know for some simplicity state you could just say maybe once per day five days a week for example um, now on its face you know when we talk about dividing doses you know you would think hey this might seem a little bit counterproductive um, when you know your desire is tumor kill right um, but tumors and normal tissue you know they're very intimate they're intimate structures um, so you know when you have when you have tissue structures that are intimate um, what is seeking to eradicate or kill off the tumor uh, can also kill normal cells and normal tissue so you know when um, fractionated doses are delivered and in, in to go back to our kind of example once a day five days a week you know we are allowing for um, the repair of sublethal damage uh, by a normal tissue process and that could take anywhere from depending on the tissue from four hours to, to 24 hours so you know malignant cells the one good thing we have going for us is malignant cells really aren't as efficient at that kind of sublethal damage repair as as healthy tissue is so uh, fractionation uh, is actually very productive because it it takes advantage of uh, the malignant cells inefficiency so you know dosing schedules like this also allow for changes in the tumor environment um, that improve the conditions for subsequent treatments and that could be anything from redistribution where you know a cell can progress from a radio resistant phase to a more radio sensitive phase um, as well as you know an oxygenation of hypoxic cells so you know there are a lot of synergistic effects in in what I just said um, and when you disrupt the fractionation process uh, through interrupted treatments or not showing up for treatments not presenting for your care um, we can really easily see why RTIs or radiation treatment interruptions are associated with poor clinical outcomes and um, my research seeks to really put that on the table and, and get it in the literature and, and get that information out there especially in these rural and underserved environments to like I said be able to really bring people um, back into the offices so that they are educated and fully understand why it's important to, uh, to present for their radiation treatments um, and also allow physicians and, and physician staffs and medical teams um, to, to really be able to kind of bridge that gap and make sure that they're doing all they can on their end to uh, really try to ensure the best quality clinical outcomes possible. So share, what are some of the myths you've heard about medical school that you later found out to be inaccurate or incorrect? Myths. Um, okay, so I, I, think, I think the first one is that if you're a certain age, you, you, can't, you can't do or you shouldn't do, um, you know, insert, insert task here. Um, I, I take a pretty hard line view of that, you know, based on, on my experience. Um, I don't think age matters, really. I mean, I, I think your work matters. I think your attitude matters. I think your attitude toward the work matters. Um, and, you know, if you set your mind to it, I, I guess why not? It should be the question you ask yourself. So I, I think the myth that age is, uh, is a limiting factor, um, outside of the obvious, right? I mean, I, I won't have a 40-year a practice. Um, you know, so age does matter in that sense, but whether you should start or do something, I, I don't think age matters. Um, you know, I, I think another myth that I've seen is you can't, as a pre-med, you can't recover from a bad grade. Um, and I want to say, I carried a 4.0 through pre-med. Uh, I carried a 4.0 through my graduate work. Um, you know, 
that was me. That was a lot of pressure put on myself. That wasn't induced pressure from external sources. That was pressure from internal sources. That was pressure from me. Um, you know, and that's pressure I put on myself. But sometimes when, when I've, I've seen pre-meds get a bad grade in something and, you know, orgo, organic chemistry comes to mind as, as something that um, students are, are somewhat fearful of and, and you do happen to see more bad grades in, in orgo. Um, you know, I, I think once you get a bad grade, and that bad grade could be a B, that bad grade could be a C or a D or, or a failing grade, um, the pressure that you put on yourself as a pre-med after that and during that experience really kind of prohibits and impairs your academic success moving forward. You can retake the class, you can explain it in an interview. Um, but you know, you really kind of want to back up and and take a take a good look about the pressure you're putting on yourself. You know, I I, I cite an example. I've been asked this before by other pre meds about specifically organic chemistry and a bad grade. Um, you know, there there's an individual that I know. He's a physician. He is an outstanding dermatologist. I mean, outstanding dermatologist. Um, his first grade in organic chemistry was a 37. A 37. And look at what he's doing now. Look at, at where he's at in life um, right now. So, you know, you can not you can recover from a bad grade. Uh, what you can't recover from is the mindset that you keep yourself in. So, you know, always be cognizant of that. Um, and I, I think the third myth that I'll talk about is when it comes to medical school and it comes to graduate work, uh, that... The, the focus only needs to be those top tier schools, whatever those top tier schools are in your mind for, for med school. Um, you know, I, I think if you, if, you play that, if you play that story forward, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the line, um, very few are going to care what med school you went to. Uh, they're, obviously, we want it to be accredited and we want it to be a, a good school, but with that being said, the pressure you put on yourself to only apply to certain schools because of their reputation or their, their status, um, again, 15, 20 years down the line, people are not going to ask what medical school you went to, but they will look at the quality of person you are and the quality of doctor you've become. So you could go to a, a righteous medical school that maybe isn't, in your mind, what you consider to be the top tier, uh, still get a, a, a great education and become the doctor you've always dreamed of. So, you know, those are, are things that I, I think pre-meds especially need to kind of keep in mind as they move forward. Share with us one of your most Share with us one of your most unforgettable, unforgettable memories on your journey, on your journey of medicine. medicine. Um, you know, I, I, I think there are a couple. Uh, I, I think one that, that sticks in my mind is when I was in the hospital bed and um, I was hooked up to all these machines and, and, you know, when they have to bring in a third IV pole um, to handle all the equipment, you kind of go, wow, this is, this is really something. Um, and, you know, I, one of the nurses walked in, she's a phenomenal nurse. Um, she and I still talk and we're friends to this day. And, you know, I, I looked at her and I said, she, she just came in to, to check an IV back. And um, I looked at her and I said, hey, I said, I'm, uh, I'm going to go to medical school. And she kind of looked at me and said, oh, oh okay, uh, that's, that's great. And I said, no, really, you know, I, I'm declaring it. I'm calling it right now. Uh, I'm, I'm going to finish pre-med. And if I can make it through this, I'm going to medical school. So, you know, I think, I think, a fond kind of fun memory throughout the whole process is declaring it and stating um, outside of my mind what it is that I was going to do and the steps I was going to take to achieve that. Um, you know, and, and some believed me, some didn't. Um, but those who knew me longest knew that it had been my passion for quite some time. Um, you know, I, I, I could go into a lot of detail about, you know, the, the things I have done as a, as a, even a teenager that kind of, uh, had kind of pushed me toward and, and that bend toward, toward medicine. It was always there. Um, but I think declaring it was, was kind of a fun, a fun memory. Um, you know, and I, and I think, uh, 
if, if you have doubt as someone who's had the experiences that I've had, um, what removes that doubt is when you've had the opportunities during clinicals, uh, rounding rotations, uh, observation time to talk to patients and you have someone that might be on the fence for a given treatment and you've been through that and you know the 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 doctor wants you to speak with them um just to give them the patient perspective and you give them that patient perspective and they drink it like water and it was what they need they 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 wanted to hear from somebody who had been there they want to know that there is hope and seeing that um maybe feeling you know overwhelmed with school and work and everything else seeing that for what it is in that moment um, makes it all worthwhile and makes the future path sustainable and and something that you you look forward to so you know that's another unforgettable moment is being tired and and, and weary you know you're at school you have work but taking a look at that patient and looking into those the, the eyes of, the, of that patient and um, having that commonality and being able to provide them with hope. Um, it's truly unforgettable. And, and those are things you carry forward, um, you know, into medicine. What are some tips and tricks you have learned in pursuing a medical degree? Ah, oh, tips and tricks. Um, you know, you use your course, it, it, and I'm speaking to the pre-meds, uh, use your courses. If, if you don't know what you want to go into, uh, and most people don't when they, they go through pre-med, uh, they have maybe a top five in terms of specialty. Um, but, you know, use your courses to figure out what interests you. Um, and then build on that. So, you know, if you've got papers and assignments for classes, use those papers and assignments not to satisfy the the requirement for the course um so much as use them to vary your interests use them to expand your horizons use them to decide uh what you might want and you know if if you think you might be interested in um neurology well when you have an opportunity and it presents itself for your coursework write a paper on something dealing with neurology expand your horizons in that way don't look at assignments as tasks look at them as opportunities and i i think the other thing uh and i keep coming back to this right is is really you know focus on the short game um keep your keep your long game as an end goal but but focus on the short game you know when when i was sick um i i i laid in the hospital and I just said, you know, most of the time I was in a lot of pain. And I said, I, I can't, I don't think I can do this much longer. And, you know, I kind of mentally talked myself through it by saying, okay, what's the, what is the maximum amount of time you can handle right now that you could focus on? And for me, it was 15 minutes. It was half of a, half of a sitcom, right? A sitcom is a half an hour. So 15 minutes was it for me. If I looked at the clock and I said, if I focus on the next 15 minutes, making it through the next 15 minutes, then maybe I can make it through the 15 minutes after that, and maybe the 15 minutes after that, and with that time will pass, and things will change, and that's what I did. I mean, you could call it kind of like a, a Pomodoro approach to living, um, taking things one bite at a time to achieve a whole, right? And for my medical situation, it was each little tiny bit of survival, each little bit of trying to get better was toward the bigger picture of, of long-term survivorship. In school, it's the same way. You might be overwhelmed, but take a giant step back, break things down into very little bits and pieces and focus solely on those little bits and pieces. That's what I mean by the short game. Focus on your short game. Get really good at your short game. And I promise you the long game will take care of itself. Could you share with us some advice you would give others who might be suffering from a chronic illness or terminal condition and are suffering to come to terms with their diagnosis? Yeah, that that's that's a very difficult question. Um, 
you know, I, I, I think each and every person is a super special, extraordinary being and each has their own way of looking at things, their own approaches. Um, for me, it was to have hope. Um, there were a couple of physicians in my path that told me that I was not going to survive. Um, facing mortality is extraordinarily difficult for anyone. Um, but with that being said, you know, there, there's no, I, I can't turn my foot over and look at my heel and find an expiration date. I can't, can't do it. It's not predetermined. Um, even with a, a terminal illness uh, or a, a, a terminal label or a, a, um, you know, a, a debilitating disease. We don't have expiration dates. So it's a very, very personal question. It's a very, very personal decision about how to spend your time. But I would say for me, I keep reminding myself and I would keep reminding patients and support groups and survivors that I, that I speak with, there's no predetermined expiration date. It is up to you to live life to your fullest. If, if that means going and, and taking a world tour or a world cruise, then do that. If it means pursuing treatment to to every logical end and seeing physicians and, and uh, second and third and fourth and fifth opinions, then by all means do that. Do both. Um, but it's a very personal decision. I would say always strive to make the most of your time and do what offers you the best sense of hope and certainly value the the relationships um that we keep and that that we hold dear um you know th those are things that that i really focused on myself and you know by and large no matter what you believe in terms of of the the afterlife or or not depending on what your beliefs are never lose a sense of hope a hope for what is to come a hope for what is now and you know, that, that would, that's usually the foundation of, of my advice, but, um, that changes depending on, you know, who's in front of me and, and who I'm speaking with. Um, cause I, I certainly don't like to force my, my values and my belief system on others. Um, but I think the one thing that's universal is we're humans and, and we do like to have a sense of, of hope. Thank you. And finally, what is your advice for pre-meds out there, regardless if they're on the traditional or non-traditional pathway to becoming a physician of the future? Oh, yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, you know, I, I think along your path, if you're, if you're, le if you're leading a, a very well-driven and, and passionate life, um, people along your path are going to tell you no. Uh, that, that's, that's the truth. Uh, you're, you're going to find people. And in some cases, they're going to be people that you might have close to you or that whose opinions, um, really matter. And you're going to, to find people that are going to tell you no. Um, but the only one whose opinion of no and telling you no, that should matter is yourself. Um, I can tell you it, it is extraordinarily far more damaging to have this dialogue of no, that I can't or I won't or I'm not supposed to in your, in your mind and in your brain. And that dialogue um, promulgates upon itself and it just keeps going. That's extraordinarily more dangerous than even somebody whose opinion you valued saying no. Uh, that, that inside talk and that talk that you, you give yourself uh, your self-talk, negative self-talk especially, is extraordinarily damaging. So I would say uh, as, as 
you know, part of that advice, believe in yourself uh, and be very careful of, of negative self-talk. Um, I would also say, as part of that, keep reinventing and in inventing and reinventing yourself. Keep moving. I mean, you know, we always, we use the adage, just make sure you're on the right track, right? But at the end of the day, uh, I mean, we, we envision like train tracks, right? We want to be on the right, all on the right set of train tracks. But if you think about it like this, even if we're standing on the right set of train tracks, if we do nothing but stand still on those tracks, we're still going to get run over. We're, we're, we're still going to get run over. So keep moving. Um, and, you know, you will make mistakes uh, as, a, as a student. You're going to make mistakes um, in pre-med. You're going to make mistakes, you know, in your clinicals. You're going to make mistakes in your research. But make interesting mistakes, right? Um, make interesting mistakes. And, you know, you kind of take that for, for what it is. Uh, you know, don't make final mistakes. Make interesting ones that you could build on and that cause you to think and um, a researcher's mistakes, right? So, you know... I, I think the other thing is keep in mind and know why you started the journey and everybody's on their own journey, which is an amazing thing, right? We all intersect with each other and, and we all play off of one another in, in a social sense, but um, you know, we all are on separate journeys and know why you started your journey. And when you feel like stopping or you get overwhelmed and, and things just seem like it's too much and that you might maybe don't want to go on with uh, the path that you're on, go back to why you started the journey. And in that, you will find your why and give it a little bit of time. And I, I, I think you'll see the, the need and you'll find that desire again to, to go on. Um, but always keep in mind and always check yourself, know why you started the journey and keep coming back to that. That was a very inspirational and moving session. I'm sure I can speak for everyone, whether they are here with us live today or tuning in afterwards or watching the recording, which we will be posting on YouTube later, that you have been amazing and we have all learned a lot from you. So again, thank you for being here and sharing your experience with us. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Right now, we will be transitioning to the Q&A session from the audience. Meanwhile, here are a few questions and comments we have received for the RSVP form. Unfortunately, some people weren't able to attend the event live, but they've written down their questions they have for you. So here's the first one from Yashila. What made you find and decide on your major? Essentially, you mentioned being passionate about medicine since young. So why medicine? Right, so, um, I don't know if you mean major like for undergrad, or uh, my the, the major for for grad school, um, but I'll, I'll kind of talk about both. You know, for me, I, I did not come from a situation where I could um, have the financial resources to depend on to go to medical school. It was a different time in a different place, and you know, with my family, it was important to get into the workforce and and you know go from there. So, you know, I knew it was an eventuality. Um, but I knew my path when I when I talked about it years down the line, it was going to be a long story. And it it has been. Um, and it has certainly been a journey. But, you know, I think in terms of uh, deciding on a major, you know, I, I'll talk a little bit about why I'm in the population health sciences program and why I'm finishing that up. Um, there's a little bit of time, right, between when I finish pre-med and when I go into medical school. So between MCAT content review, which is an ongoing process, um, I really wanted to continue to stay relevant and have value added. So I chose the major and the school that I did because of the heavy bend toward research. I wanted to get uh, more publications. I wanted to do thought forward research uh, in the field of my choice. And, you know, like I, like I talked about a little earlier, uh, and explore a little bit, right, to write papers in classes that could either confirm that I know exactly what specialty and, and what path I want to pursue down the line, or um, the other option is maybe have the opportunity to re re retweak that a little bit. So, you know, my major for my master's degree is a little bit different than, than choosing my major for undergrad. 
Um, but for those that are in pre-med programs and who are, are kind of soul searching as to major, um, I think the first thing is follow your heart. And the second thing is, um, you know, with that being said, make sure that you're getting a good foundation. And uh, I cannot understate, um, or should I say overstate, I, I say I cannot overstate it enough that you, you really want to get as well-rounded as possible. And so that concludes the comments and questions we have received from the forum. For the audience who are here with us today, feel free to raise your hands and ask any questions you have or drop those in the chat. Okay, we have received one question. What is the one quote that inspires you that you would like to share with us? Uh, is that a quote? Yes, like a quote or saying. Wow. Um... You know, I, I, I'll tell you, I, I just, I would have to say, when I, when I was sick, I had um, written down a quote um, in one of the books I was reading. Uh, that was another thing I did in the hospital. I read a lot. Um, and I kept coming back to it. And... It helped me get through conflict. It helped me. It's really simple. Helped me get through conflict. It helped me get through some of the hardest moments where I didn't think I could go on. And that's true both in, uh, you know, going through pre-med and, and working full time and, and having the fellowship and um, so on and so forth. And, and also my illness. And it was very simple. And it was three words. It was argue all limitations. Very simple. But it helped me um, with my confidence and feel so much stronger across the board. Just very simple, argue all limitations. That is a great quote. So we have no more questions from our audience as well. Once again, thank you Kristen for being such a wonderful guest speaker and answering our questions so patiently. Before we end, Here's a brief quiz for our audience, and the link will be sent to you via email later. You can also scan the QR code shown on the screen for your convenience. Your responses will be graded, and you should receive a confirmation along with your score by the end of today. Also, before we end, here's a little self-promotion here. Remember to sign up for Empowering Med's internship program if you are interested in working with us and getting more involved with our organization. We offer tons of amazing benefits recommendation letters, volunteer hours, new initiatives, and different leadership roles for you to take up within the organization. So be sure to register using the form sent in the chat. Thank you for your participation in our fourth event, and we hope to see you in our future events.